Ironically, for me, maybe that's the wrong word, but I used to call this Junior College Day. And then last year, an RSVP came in from a parent saying he wasn't going to be there for Junior College Day. And then in February, he sent me an email saying, when are you doing the four-year college day? <laughs> so I've had to change the name. Now, if you got that joke, that's a good sign that you're ahead of the curve. If that doesn't mean anything to you, uh, at the end of today, it will. Uh, I want to start off introducing Bill Taylor. Most of you have met Headmaster Taylor, Aaron's wife. But uh, Bill's gone through this experience a couple times uh, with some children. And I wanted him to share some thoughts. So, thank you. Well, yours. Happy New Year, everybody. Welcome back. Thank you, Aaron thank you for being with us. Appreciate your, your support of this process. We look forward to hearing your wisdom. <laughs> um, you know, I have gone through this uh, a couple times as a parent. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, from a parent perspective, you know, I can say this in hindsight, it's really exciting. Uh, you know, sometimes at the time it can be uh, it can be a little uh, you know nerve wracking, um, but I think both the excitement and sometimes the uh, the anxiety from a parental perspective comes from the same source, and that is this is a process that is it's a revelatory process uh, in the sense that uh, your children you know sort of you're going to see different aspects of them begin to emerge on this journey. Uh, and uh, I know with my son, who was, uh, you know, in high school, he was a terrible procrastinator. He's now a teacher, so uh, I, I, hopefully he's not procrastinating in that role. But as a student in high school, he, he sort of kept things off to the last minute. And it, it drove me a little crazy because, uh, you know, I'm saying, you know, you, you know, your applications, we were living in, in uh, Memphis, Tennessee at the time, so it's was ten central time zone. And so the applications were all due online at like midnight on whatever date it was. And I kept saying, okay, you know you were living in the central time zone. That's 11 o'clock for you. Don't say, you know, don't think it's midnight. And of course, he sent the send button at, at 10.56 or something. And, uh, but, you know, that was... That was all part of the process of growth for him, uh, and uh, and as a parent, you know, I discovered things about both my children, my son and my daughter, through this journey, uh, and I found that I was able to uh, contribute uh, as a parent to the process without taking over the process, and that was a very good transitional lesson for me as a father, that uh, I could be engaged in the process, but it was not my process to own. Uh, I could guide, I could encourage, I could cajole, uh, I could uh, be there to support them, uh, because there's disappointment along the way in this process, and sort of seeing how your child navigates disappointment and excitement uh, is a glimpse into their emerging adulthood. And, and that is very exciting to see, too. Um, and then finally, it's a didactic process, meaning there are important lessons that your sons are going to learn through this process. Um, they're going to learn how to be more attuned to their own self-awareness, things that, they, that they're interested in. You know, some of the curricular changes that we've made here over the last several years are designed, specifically designed to expose the boys to greater opportunities of self-awareness. Uh, getting them to think about, okay, I like this, or I don't like this so much, because that self-awareness will guide will be an important uh, uh, ally in this overall college process. Um, and uh, and that, that's important. I mentioned sort of the disappointment. That, you know, and it comes with this. Uh, you know, my daughter was so excited to apply to her, her uh, first
first choice school. She applied early decision. It was sort of, you know, she'd gone there. She really enjoyed it at the time. She sort of said, you know, I want to be at a certain size college in the South. I want to be in the South. And uh, so we found a place that sort of fit the bill. She was excited about it, applied early decision, and didn't get in. And, uh, and her college uh, guidance counselor, uh, Mr. Mead's counterpart at that school, gave her great advice. Uh, he said, you can be upset for 48 hours, but after those 48 hours, you're, you know, uh, you're going to get right back into this process. Uh, and she did. And she ended up, her list ended up getting much wider. Uh, she started up, she applied to colleges out west and the midwest and the east. Uh, and she ended up at a place that was really the, a much better fit for her than where she had applied early decision. There's no way that she would have been able to know that on the front end, but had to learn that through this process. Um, and that's this important instruction about that as well. Um, and then the last bit of, of sort of the instructional aspect of this is that uh, the school is going to be here as uh, a source of support, a uh, source of guidance. Uh, we're going to have some structures in place in terms to help students with the deadlines. Uh, but we're not applying to college. And, uh, and so increasingly, you know, your sons are going to take on more and more of this responsibility. Because after the applications go out, you know, the colleges are really, you know, they're going to be communicating with them. They're going to send emails. And uh, there was a really interesting article in the New York Times a couple of years ago about sort of the communication rift that, that had begun to occur on college campuses with professors and administrators at the colleges using email to communicate and kids, students, using text to communicate. And the students were texting their professors and their professors weren't texting them back. Uh, and the professors were emailing the students and the students weren't emailing them back because they weren't checking their email. Well, you know, who do you think is going to win that dynamic? It'll, you know, it'll be the professors. Uh, they're communicating. So students, if you have not been very good about checking your email, this is a good way to get you into that habit. Uh, because college is going to want to hear back from you. If they send you an email, they're going to want to hear back from you. Um, being attentive to deadlines. Those are important life skills. Uh, and students, you've had these deadlines all along here, but now these deadlines have even much larger uh, implications if they're missed. Uh, and because there, there aren't extensions, typically, uh, with these deadlines. Now, we'll help you out with that, uh, but increasingly, this is going to become more and more of your responsibility. And that is just going to make you a more effective, uh, more increasingly independent communicator, which is a great thing, a great skill to have uh, as a college student. It's a great skill to have, obviously, as an adult. Um, but it's an exciting process. Uh, and it's a, it's a year and a half journey that uh, will lead in different ways for different people. Some people may know exactly where they're going to be going, and that's ends up, that will end up being the case. They will go where they thought they were going to go. For others, it, it'll be, you may think you have one destination and you end up in a different place because of this, this uh, growth that you will be undertaking. Uh, and I guarantee you that at the end of this process, you will know yourself, students, much more clearly, parents. You will have a much broader uh, awareness of your sons through this process. Uh, and both are, are wonderful things. So with that, I will turn this over to Slade. But I will also, before I do that, 
I want to just uh, focus on one thing uh, as another attribute that the school has uh, that parallels this process, and that is the senior leadership program. So I'm actually going to have Ralph Fidelli, who runs the senior leadership program, otherwise known as the Ropes Course, uh, talk a little bit about that, and then Mr. Eaton will talk about how that dovetails into what will what be going on in the next year. How's everyone doing? Um, so just quickly, uh, the Ropes Course program uh, is a program each spring um, that every junior uh, will participate in. Um, it's a two-day course, all day Sunday. Um, they sleep over, and then it'll be all day Monday. Um, and what it entails is um, a lot of problem solving as a team um, and, and building some team camaraderie, but also problem solving and uh, leadership. Um, as the seniors are kind of making their way uh, to graduation and, and thinking about college, um, we're looking to the junior class as the leaders of the school. And the Ropes Course program is part of that process where we start looking to them uh, to build those leadership skills and come together as a class. Um, from you, um, there's a parental permission slip in your folder. Um, and we just ask that you fill that out and get that back to us um, as soon as possible. And hopefully we can have them all by uh, March break, um, which will make the logistics of scheduling uh, the spring program that much easier. If they fill them out today, I'll take them. Yeah, if you fill them out today, uh, Mr. Mead will certainly take them, and that would be great. Um, but it, it, the program's been around for quite some time, I believe. Mr. Collins was on it uh, during his time period, um, and I also was on the uh, road course as a student here. Um, so I can attest to the uh, kind of impact it has as a student. Thank you. We've been doing this since 1992, senior leadership program. All right. <clears throat> Well, here, here we go. Um, I try to run this like a Swiss train system, so we're going to stick right to the agenda and we're going to finish right on time. I appreciate people coming back a little bit early uh, for today. This, this is a, a, a bittersweet day for Scott Harp and myself. I'm going to introduce Mr. Harp in a second. But I want to tell you, this is the day, it, it's a tough one, because this is the day we say goodbye to the seniors and say hello to you. Uh, we've gotten to know these seniors pretty well. In fact, I can probably tell you the blood type of most of my seniors by now. And uh, it, it, it's painful to push them out of the nest, and, and now we bring them in, in this year's class. So it's a bittersweet moment. I do want to introduce Scott Harp. If, if some of you haven't met Scott yet, he, he's the other half of the office as far as uh, working one-on-one -on -one with, the, with the seniors. Uh, Scott's in this, will be going into his third year with this uh, job, and um, I can't be uh, happier to have Scott as a partner in this. Uh, we work very well together. Uh, we communicate probably about 50 times a day, so we know what's going on. Uh, he picks up the slack for me, I pick up the slack for him. Uh, and if you look in your pamphlet, you'll see a business card. If you've got Scott's business card, first off, congratulations. If you got my business card, condolences. Uh, that is who you are slated to work with. Now, having said that, if you don't like the business card in front of you, you can flip-flop, no problem. But this is how uh, Mr. Harp and I have divided the class. Uh, but talk to one of us if you'd like to do the flip-flop. Um, I also want to introduce Denise Palmer. Denise uh, has probably more institutional history than anyone at Trinity Pauling. She's had three children attend the school. Two of them were head prefects, and the sloucher was only the junior head prefect. So uh, they've been quite involved. Uh, Denise is truly amazing. Uh, a lot of times you'll be very happy because you thought Scott and I did something really well. well. The fact of the matter is Denise did it really well, and then we take the credit. Uh, if you do have questions and you can't get hold of 
Scott or myself, feel free to call Denise. And she's also, one of her greatest attributes, in my opinion, is if she doesn't know the answer, she'll tell you, I don't know the answer, but I will get back to you with it. Uh, and and um, we're just, I, my office is blessed to have Denise. So uh, she's been working hard these last few days getting this ready, and so I appreciate all your work. Thanks, that's Denise. Okay, uh, in your packet, on the left-hand side, there's a rather long, dry document. Uh, I don't want you to start reading it now. I want you to take it home with you. I'm willing to bet that if you have any questions at the end of today, the answer to your question will be in that long, dry document. It is an interesting aside. The document is written to two audiences, both parents and to the students. So it does flip-flop a little bit in voice, depending on what the question is. But I think it's going to answer a lot of questions that you may have uh, about the college process. I've also put in, the, or Denise put into your packet, uh, the PSAT test. The, the final uh, grades are supposed to be sent to me by paper on January 15th. So if you hold on to the test, students, your answer sheet with your grades on it, you should have gotten your grades already, but the answer sheet that shows what you answered will be in your mailbox on January 15th or 16th. Uh, if you're taking AP classes, there's also some information about the APs coming up in May. Okay. This is a, I'm going to up front apologize. There are going to be some terms that we're going to use. I, I, what's going to happen is Mr. Hart's going to run the panel discussion. So you've got me for now. Then we're going to have Chris Doyle uh, from Maris, who's going to share some thoughts, which were actually quite in line with what, what Mr. Taylor said about communication. And that's sort of the theme of today is communication. Um, in this business, we use terms, and, and I was listening to Ms. Kuchma talking about the financial aid, and she threw out ED, ED2, EA, rolling, ba ba ba. If you didn't quite follow what she was talking about, that's fine. It's all in the long, dry packet, but early decision. Let me just, we got to have some basic terms. Early decision is a binding agreement where you've decided on a college, and if you apply to that college, you agree you're going to go there if accepted. The advantage to you is the college knows you're going to go there if they accept you. So you're a little, you're looked in a little bit better light. Because if you don't apply early decision and you get into a school either regular or early action, you don't have to say yes, you're coming until May. And that's tough on the college because they want to start putting together their next year's freshman class as early as they can. So early decision gives you a little bit of a leg up, but you've got to make sure that's really the college you want to go to and attend. Early action is a really nice tool that lets you apply early. And when I was talking about early, we're talking about uh, middle of October or beginning of November. You get an answer right around Christmas time. With early action, you get the answer, but you don't have to say yes until May. Not every school offers early decision. Not every school offers early action. Every school has a different combination, and, and we'll get into that with the panel discussion. But it's important that when you hear ED, that means early decision. That's the wedding. That's the bind. EA is early action. Guys, I think of the ED as the wedding. Early action is like dating. It's not a commitment. So for most uh, high school guys, they really like EA. <laughs> you got to loosen this crowd up. Come on. Okay, um, I do want to share three things with you that should make everybody in this room happy with the exception of Jack Sawyer's sister. Uh, we deal with boys. And why do I bring that up? More women are going to college now than men. That's just the demographics of the college world. And as a result, men are more attractive as candidates. Than, than women. Hey, I'll, I'll take it. So that's a positive, working to our advantage. The second positive is you're going to have a lot of colleges visiting 
this campus next fall. This year we had about 140. That is a huge opportunity. And this gives you a chance as the student to get in front of the rep who's going to be your advocate in the admissions process at a college and make a personal contact. A personal contact. Look them in the eye. Mr. Doyle from Marist, nice to meet you. My name is Slade. I am so excited about Marist College. And then that gives you the opportunity to follow up with Mr. Doyle from Marist with a thank you note, written, emailed. It, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity that Trinity Pauling is going to offer you. The other thing we do, and this is important, I think, to, to appreciate, and it's, 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 it takes a while to let it sink in, but the application has many different pieces. I'm going, to get, I'm going to go over those in a second. But one of the pieces is called the secondary school report. Arguably, this is one of the reasons why you pay a lot of money to send your child to Trinity Hall <coughs> School. This is a letter tailor-made for your son. Now, big, big, big public schools, a lot of times they check a box just saying, we got too many kids, we can't even start these letters. So the colleges are like, okay, missed opportunity, but we get it. A lot of the private schools have Mr. Harf and Mr. Mead write all these letters. That's terrific if I know you. It's not so hot if I don't know you very well. And what Trinity Pauling does, and I would say this is a little bit of a secret sauce that gives us a, a, a little bit of an advantage, is we have something called the Dunham Committee, named after Bill Dunham. And what we do is we have a collection last year, I think we had 15 teachers on the Dunham Committee. And in May, it's kind of fun, we have a baseball draft. We put all the juniors on the board. We deal out <coughs> cards. Then we pick, we draft. So you're getting a teacher who knows your son taking the son off the board because the teacher wants to write about that person. So if I know Danny really, really well, I may draft Danny. And it's then in his best interest to have somebody write the initial rough draft who knows the student really, really well. I know this works because I've had colleges come back to me saying, how on earth do you know these kids so well? Well, I don't necessarily, but the person who wrote the first draft may be on dorm with them, may have them in a class, and also may coach them, and probably is the advisor. So the Dunham Committee has been a really valuable asset for us. And personally, I kind of like it when the other private schools keep doing it with just the the college counselors writing all the SSRs because they become very flat and, and they become very similar. Um, our SSRs, I would argue, really shine. The other thing about this process is starting tomorrow, uh, your son can start signing up with Mr. Harp and me for one-on-one -on -one meetings. We're going to build a college list. To come to my meeting, I can't speak for Mr. Harp, but I'm pretty sure the same rule will apply. There's a brag sheet that I sent by email. So you've got to open up your email, download the brag sheet, and you have to fill it out. This is for the students. And bring the brag sheet to the meeting. It is your admissions ticket to the meeting. Please don't show up for a meeting saying, oh, I didn't open up the email and I didn't bring the brag sheet. No good. You've got to bring the brag sheet with you. That brag sheet, though, is very, very helpful uh, because a lot of times, and I'll give you an example, we, last year's class, or two years ago, we had four kids who were Eagle Scouts. But we don't know they're Eagle Scouts because that all happened before they got here. But boy, you want to put that in the applications. And we learned about them through the brag sheets. Um, so brag sheets are very, very important. The parts of the application I'm going to go through briefly. Uh, the transcript, I would argue, is probably the most important part. I always get this question, what's the most important part? Uh, colleges love uh, transcripts where there's an upward progression. Uh, if you've had some dips and valleys, don't panic. There's still school out there that will love you. 
but the more you can keep it on an upward progression, uh, the better. Test scores. A lot of schools now are test optional, so this is becoming less and less important, but the SATs and ACT scores, if you are applying to a non-test optional school, and I will send you all a list of which colleges are now test optional, uh, those, those two are important. You can take the test as many times as you like. Uh, a lot of schools do something called super score, where they'll take the best components of the test and build a new score based on your best components. So for the ACT, there are four parts. They'll look for the best of the four parts from different texts. The next one is your involvement. Are you in clubs? Are you involved in um, Trinitones? Are you involved in the, do you write for the paper? Are you playing athletics? They want to see activity. They want to see you're involved. They want to see that you do something in the summer, whether it's a summer job or you're working in uh, community service. They want to see that involvement. The next one is the teacher recs. Uh, when you have a meeting with Mr. Harp and myself, you're going to be asked to give us the names of two teachers that you'd like to write recommendations for you. It doesn't have to be the class you necessarily got the best grade in. You want the class where you're the most engaged in. But come armed to that meeting saying, I'd like so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so to be teacher rec writers. Give it some thought, but be ready. The next component is the secondary school report, which I've already talked about. We do that. You don't do that. Um, the interview is sort of the, gone by way of the dinosaur, sadly. Uh, people of my generation, actually when I started 10 years ago, people of our generation, well now, you guys are all younger than I am, but in the 80s and 90s, you could still go get an interview at a lot of these schools, and they meant something meaningful. It's not as big a deal anymore because there's just so many kids applying. Some schools still offer the one-on-one -on -one interviews, and if they do, take full advantage of it, but don't panic if they don't. Uh, back when I applied, every school would do an interview. Well, they don't do that anymore. Okay, there are a couple things I want to go over, and then I'm going to pass it to my dear friend, Mr. Doyle from Merrick's. First, I'm begging you to start checking email. We had a student two years ago who decided he wanted to apply to Case Western Reserve. He didn't get into his first choice. Case Western then became very attractive to him. He came to me and said, have you heard anything from Case Western? I said, I haven't heard anything. I'll call. I talked to our rep. They said, oh, we've sent him 13 emails, and he hasn't opened any of them. I think it's safe to say he will not be at Case Western. There's nothing Mr. Harp and I can do at that point. You've got to read your emails. You've got to read your emails. Second. This is the first time for parents, and what I'm about to say is going to hit some of you hard, that you, as a parent, cannot swoop in and save the day. If your child has missed a deadline, the college is not going to take the call from mom asking for the extension. It's very hard for some parents because they've become so good at fixing the problems for the kids. This process is the kids. That is tough. You can keep on your kid to make sure he gets things in on time, but if there's a missed date, it's on the kid. I want to read another thing about communication, because this is so true. This happened. Um, this happened to one of our kids who got into a fight with his mother in the parking lot of the admissions office, parked next to the director's car, when the director was in the car. This is written by the director at Dartmouth, Rebecca Sadke. That's not, this isn't the incident, but this has happened because I've gotten calls. Until admissions committees figure out a way to effectively recognize the genuine but intangible personal qualities of applicants, we must rely on little things to make the difference. The little things. Communication. Listen carefully. Sometimes an inappropriate email address is more telling than a personal asset. 
Think about that for a second. Gentlemen, please use your Trinity Pauline email address. It's very bland. Don't use super jock da 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 at I'm the best friggin' guy in the world that look at me. Huh. Don't. Please. The way a student acts towards his parents on a campus tour can mean as much as a standardized test score. If you might throw a fizzy fit, do it after you've left the campus. And as I learned from, this, from a custodian, a sincere character evaluation from someone unexpected will mean more to us than any boilerplate recommendation from a former president or famous golfer. Well, I get this question all the time. Um, you know, do you mind if Barack Obama sends in a recommendation for my son? I go, wow, I didn't know your son. Oh, he doesn't. But a friend of a friend of a friend's uncle knows that, that yeah, we can get a letter. Focus on the application. If there's somebody who you absolutely need to have write a letter of recommendation because they've just known you forever and they can be a good character reference, that is so much more valuable than Barack. Okay? That's a hard one because I know a lot of parents are already thinking in their mind, it's time to do the network. Oh, I can get to so and so. I think he was a trustee 30 years ago. And he was so and so's former. Yeah. Focus on the, the application. Um, I left out one piece of the application, and this is what I might leave you on, because I love this. the essay. The essay. Gentlemen, you're going to write a really good essay. The sooner you start, and we're going to work with you in the spring, getting this going, the better. We've had essays where we've had 14, 15 drafts. I want to read an essay of a student who was a C plus, B minus student who poured his heart into this essay. And this was about 10 drafts. And this was sent to Swanee, which is the University of the South. And quite honestly, I didn't think Todd had a prayer getting in to Swanee. And he knows I tell this story. But let me read this essay to you. And you're going to see some things that you Put in your mind, because you can do the same thing. Before three weeks ago, this essay was going to be about my grandfather, a man whom I love and admire. Bill's a four-star general in the Air Force, and growing up with him has given me an arsenal of many great stories that would have been adequate for this essay. But three weeks ago, something happened that will change my life forever and takes this essay from adequate to something incredible. That's a nice intro. It's a hook. Wait a minute, you got a four-star general as a grandfather and you're not going to write about him? This better be good. But they hook you. You've been hooked. you got to read on. Let me set the scene. It was an average Wednesday night. My homework was done. Although I should have gone to sleep, I was wide awake and bored. I decided to do some internet browsing. Let me tell you, you don't know the definition of bored until you've attended an all-boys boarding school. There's absolutely nothing to do after 8 o'clock at night. Anyway, I decided to check MySpace. Uh, MySpace for you youngsters is the old Facebook. It's gone, but it was like Facebook years ago. Uh, check MySpace. Now, I'm an admitted Facebook addict and gave up MySpace long ago, but on this Wednesday night, I decided to check MySpace. Maybe it was fate. Maybe coincidence. Who knows? I logged on. There was a friend request from a 14-year-old girl from San Jose, California. I found this kind of weird, but I shrugged it off and just assumed there was another girl who had fallen in love with my profile picture. <laughs> Since this does not happen often, I probably should have assumed something else, but sometimes our ego gets the best of us. I clicked accept and thought nothing else of it. A little self deprecating humor sets the scene, I'm at a boarding school, all male. You've actually learned a lot about this kid without really being told, I go to an all boys boarding school. Though. It, it's a very subtle essay. And I, I'm not sure we have time to finish it. But, you, want <laughs> you want the admissions officer to say, oh my god, what's going on here? 
About 30 minutes later, I refreshed the page and had one new message. The message was from this 14-year-old girl whom I just accepted as a friend. The message read, quote, hey, can I talk to you? Unquote. I found this a little strange, but again, did not think anything of it. After all, she's in California, and I'm in a dorm somewhere in rural New York. I replied, sure, what's up? When she replied, my life changed forever. I forgot the rest of the essay. Gotcha. What the hell's going on? You want to know what's going on? Good job, Todd. A message came across my screen reading, were you by any chance adopted from San Luis Obispo, California in 1990? I get choked up. This was a huge event here on school when this happened. My sirens were going off. I still had no clue what was going on, but my mind was sure guessing. I immediately replied, yes, yes I was. Who are you? How do you know that? For the next 20 minutes, my heart was pounding as my mind guessed what could possibly be going on. I refreshed the page every 30 seconds in anticipation of her answer. Then it finally came. The message simply read, I am your sister. This was a huge surprise to me. My whole life I had been an only child who was adopted from California, living in Alabama. My adopted parents, as far as I'm concerned, have been my only immediately, excuse me, immediate family members. I have never thought to look for my birth parents or considered that I had any siblings. I was excited. I jumped up from my desk and ran around the dorm screaming that I had a sister. This is actually all very true. Uh, my dorm mates were not as excited about being pulled out of bed as I was about finding her, but I did not care. I had to tell someone. Ever since that night, I've been talking to her constantly. We immediately became best friends. Even though we have not yet met in person, if you saw us together, it would seem like we had grown up together, not separated by 14 years. Since this amazing discovery, I've been asked by everyone from my best friend to my grandmother what I think about finding my biological sister. Before I can answer that question, I have to do some deep thinking. First, I'm in total shock to find out that there's another person in this world that not only shares my blood and genetic makeup and has a physical appearance similar to myself, but one who has been adopted since birth as well. Then, when I get over the shock, I become extremely excited. Excited because I, Todd Kirkpatrick, have a little sister. I love the idea of getting to be the cool older brother who's always there for his sister. Mandy just started high school, and I know that my experiences can only help her get through these next four years. 2009 is turning out to be an amazing year. A year ago, I never envisioned myself taking a postgraduate year somewhere in rural New York, nor did I ever think I would be applying to Swanee, one of the premier colleges in the world. The real amazing thing, however, is there will be a young high school girl in California telling her friends, quote, yeah, my brother plays basketball at Swanee. That's where I want to go to college, too. You know, family has to stick together. It, it's doable. It's doable. Uh, the, the Swanee admissions office actually called me, and they put me on a speakerphone, and they all started clapping. And they said this, this essay, uh, was his ticket to admission to Swanee University. The essay can be huge. You've got to invest the time, the energy, and the effort. But that story told you a lot about Todd Kirkpatrick. By not coming right out and just saying, this is who I am, you've got the feel for the guy. Um, by the way, his sister ended up marrying a Trinity Pauling friend of Todd's. <laughs> so the story continues. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce one of my best friends in the college business, Chris. Um, I'm sorry, I, I get that, that, that really, that's essay or is not that. Uh, Chris Doyle is at Marist University here in Poughkeepsie, and uh, he's just one of the greatest guys to work for or work with. Uh, and this is the type of relationship that Mr. Harp and I try to cultivate with every college, uh, where I can pick up the phone and we can have some very frank discussions and go deeper than the application. And, and we're lucky because Trinity Pauling gives us the time uh, to do that. We go to a lot of conferences, we meet a lot of reps, and there's a friendship that's formed and a trust that's formed. Uh, but I've asked Chris to speak 
about the college process, and I told them that communication was the theme for this year. So I would like to introduce everybody to a really, really good friend of mine, a good friend of Trinity Pauly, Chris Doyle from Maris. Try to keep this Swiss train moving as efficiently as possible. Uh, Slave was the one who picked an Irishman to drive the Swiss train, so I'm going to do the best I can here. Uh, I've worked in college admissions for 12 years. I'm a graduate of Marist College for my undergraduate degree, uh, went elsewhere for my graduate degree, and I've worked at Marist and I've worked at Johns Hopkins University, and then I came back to Marist uh, to the role that I'm in now, where I lead the admission office and the team of admission representatives who go across the country and overseas to meet with students just like you and learn more about you. And in those 12 years, there have been some significant changes and there have been some things that have pretty much stayed the same um, throughout the process. Um, so one of the things that, as I was preparing for this, you know, I was, obviously it's the holidays, I'm talking to friends and family, and I'm saying I'm delivering the keynote at Trinity Pauline to kind of help the family sort of go into this process get started. And they told me, you know, a keynote speaker has to have um, intelligence and to be articulate and to really get to the point and keep the conversation lively. Um, and Slade let me know that, unfortunately, knowing what those qualifications was available, so he wanted me to come in and take, take the stand here. Um, but let me just ask for the parents that are here, how many of you, this is your first child going off to college? Uh, and how many of you, this is your last child going off to college? Right. So I've asked that question in almost every state and uh, internationally, and for some reason, the second group always has a huge smile on their face. Yeah. Uh, that family up there gave a high five when they put their hands up. Um, it's exciting, right? So whenever you're sending a child off to college, there's some anxiety, there's some excitement, there's some unknowns. Uh, but it's a great experience and something that you shouldn't dread. It's something that you should really look forward to because you're going to learn a lot about uh, your son. You're going to learn a lot about yourself. And the process can actually be a fun and exciting one and not one that is filled completely with fear and anxiety, although there will be, there'll be some of that. Um, there are three reasons that the process um, is different. And, and the three reasons are, one, uh, the admission process changes every year. Right? So like I said, some things have changed each year, some things have stayed the same, but there are changes every year. Two, every student's journey is different. So for the students in the room, your best friend who might be sitting next to you will have a very different college application and search process than you will. And it's just based on the goals that they have in mind or things that they've discussed with their family and plans that they've made while they're here at Trinity Hall. Uh, the other is that colleges and universities are not staffed. Right, they are continuously evolving. So if you take Marist, for example, founded in the 1920s by about 50 Marist brothers who came over from France, and they intended the school to be a school for young men to come and train as Marist brothers to then go back to their community or to other communities across the country and around the world and to serve those communities well and to focus on things like excellence in education and commitment to service and, and those types of things. Fast forward 40 years to the 1960s, Marist had become a popular place in Poughkeepsie relative to the time, and they opened the doors to women and became an independent college. Non-denominational school where people from all faiths could come in and could study a limited scope uh, that they offered at the time. Then, fast forward to now, and you have a 300-acre campus on the Hudson River with 6,000 undergraduate students from 47 states and 64 countries around the world studying over 50 different majors, over 100 different minors, participating in 23 NCAA Division I athletic teams, theater clubs, cybersecurity center, all sorts of different things that are offered. The college owns a farm, a 200-acre farm in Poughkeepsie. There's a campus in Florence, Italy where we have four to 500 students a year who are studying there. 
There's an 18,000 square foot executive center on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, which we're just waiting for the paperwork to come through so we can actually have people in the doors. And most recently, the college just announced a medical school. So there's been a lot of change, and those changes are great for Maris, but they're also emblematic of the things that are happening in the higher ed space right now at thousands of colleges and universities across the country. So from the time that you as parents might have been in college to now, the schools that you attended are very different. And you've probably seen this on Alumni Weekend if you've been back. Um, but their priorities are changing as well as the institution is evolving. Right? So their goals are changing. Their trustees have new things in mind. They're holding their presidents of these colleges and universities accountable for different things. So for you, and I think it's evident based on the opening remarks, you have a stellar team behind you here, right? Mr. Mead and Mr. Harf are very good at what they do. In my 12 years of experience in college admissions, they are two of the best advocates for their students that I've seen at any school across the country. They do a terrific job. And they will call me or call somebody in my office if they had questions about what's happening on our side. But they'll also call to let us know about things that might be happening on your side that aren't necessarily evident within your application. But because they're there, you know, it's not, not a reason for you to take your foot off the gas in this process. You have work to do. And it will take some work and it will take some effort. And communication is obviously the theme of today. And so for me, thinking about the students who've been the most successful in this process, the ones who've navigated it without stressing themselves out and having a breakdown. Uh, those are the students who have effectively communicated with the colleges, with their college counselors, and with their families. If you can cover all three of those bases, you're putting yourself ahead of the pack because I promise you, the majority of students in the country are not focusing on communication with the college, with their college counselors, and with their families about this process. We see it all the time on, on the visits on campus. The parents are just starting to learn what the students are interested in in terms of the major, or what might be a good fit for them. Where the parents have one thing in mind, but the student has something completely different, and they're trying to kind of bridge that gap as they're walking around the college touring the campus. So those conversations, that type of communication is really important and, and to make it happen. In terms of communication with the colleges, you're going to have a representative, as I said before, over 140 schools came to Trinity Paul this past year. So you will have a representative from multiple schools that you'll have the opportunity to get to know. And I, I really encourage you to take advantage of that. It behooves you to do so. So when they're here, meet with them. When you go on a campus tour, it is incredibly important that you make an appointment and not just show up. Make an appointment so that you have a place in the information session and the tour, but then so you can also get some face time with the representative who's responsible for Trinity Hall. Because that's typically how colleges break it down. For me, you know, we have staff members who are responsible for different states and sometimes specific types of schools within the states. All right, so it's important for you to learn who that person is and to be able to communicate with them. When you meet with them, you want to have a little bit more knowledge than surface level information you could have found on the website. There's nothing more disappointing than for a student to reach out to you, to schedule a meeting with you while they're on campus, and for them to sit in front of you and stumble not knowing what to say or what to ask. So think about what's important to you before you get there and start doing some research. Maybe it's about the major. Maybe it's about athletics. Maybe it's about dorms on campus or food in the dining hall. But it's really important for you to start thinking about those things so you can have a meaningful conversation with these people when you're at their campus or when they're here at Trinity Pauling or when you're visiting with them at a college fair. Right? Trinity Pauling also goes to a college fair each year you're going to meet lots of colleges in one place. So take advantage of that time that you have with them. Also, be responsible in terms of following up. If you had a great conversation with somebody and they took a half an hour out of their day to sit down and meet with you while you visited, send them a thank you. And if you don't have great penmanship, send them an email. If you have nice penmanship, send them a handwritten note. I can tell you 90% of the thank yous I get are, are emails. So when I get a handwritten note, it kind of has that extra meaning that a student took the time to do that and to drop it in the mail. Um, I can tell you that it's pretty easy to tell when mom or dad wrote the note and when the student wrote the note. So please just make sure that you as a student are taking the lead in this process 
uh, for a number of reasons, but, but certainly when you're sending, sending a thank you note. It's also important that you keep your conversations formal. Right? So if you think about a college admissions representative who's out there traveling for six, seven, eight weeks during the fall, and then they're going back in mid-November, and they start to read applications, and they go through applications, and they do that pretty much all the way through March. And then at that point, they start to meet with all the accepted students when they have these big accepted events. This is a job that people go into because they like working with students and families, but they're also typically 22, 23 when they start. So they're not that much older than you. So it's easy for a student to kind of slip into the mode of you know, talking to them like they're just a little bit older because they're only three or four years older than, you, than some of you will be at that point. Keep it formal. Email and phone calls are the appropriate way to communicate with college admission offices. There will be some colleges and universities that will text you. So if they text you, you can text them back. But I would not start sending them messages on Facebook or finding them on Instagram or, or doing those types of things. All right? Just keep it formal. Treat it like kind of a business relationship. Remember, though, that this is definitely a human process. All right, so these are the people who are making decisions on whether or not you're offered admission to their institution. But they are doing it because they're really interested in helping students discover, you know, the path that they're going to find and building that community of students who will be, for us, you know, the next year or next generation of, of Red Foxes. So you know, that's why people get into college admissions because they like working with students and families through that process. All right, so remember that. These little things that were mentioned before, these are really important things for that moment when they're sitting in a room talking about 10 candidates and trying to figure out which one to offer admission to for that institution. Right? It's not like you send the application in, it gets run through a computer, they pick the kids with the highest GPAs and the highest SAT scores, and then they send out decision letters. It takes an enormous effort on the college side to identify those students that they want to offer admission to because it's important. Right? We're enrolling freshman students in the hopes that we're going to graduate them four years from now and that they'll become alumni and be connected to the institution for the years to come. All right? So just remember it's, it's a human process. Um, you know, when you think about the way that colleges are utilizing email, there's a number of different things that are happening with them. So I want to give you just some examples of what those things are. I realize that I'm standing between you and a snack break, so I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as I can. Um, some colleges do track email opens and engagement. So what does that mean? So the example I was given before with Case Western, that student was sent 13 emails, and they could tell that that student didn't open one. On the college side, we have you know, 13,000 students applying to Marist this year. We're going to seat 1,300 in our freshman class. We're trying to figure out which students are the most interested. So do we go and look at every student's email engagement rate? No. But if there are students that we're in committee and we're debating whether or not we should offer them admission, a natural question to ask is, well, how engaged has this student been? Have they visited campus? Have they sent us an email? Have they talked to their representative from the area? Have they looked at the emails? <coughs> Did they click on any of the emails? Well, let's take a look. We can see. Right? We have the system to do that. We can actually see. And we oftentimes learn things about that student that we wouldn't otherwise have learned. And that helps kind of drive some of the decisions that we make. But it also helps us figure out who will enroll at the college and who will persist and who will graduate. Right, so there are some colleges that have done research on this and they've shown the students who demonstrate the least amount of interest through the process who end up enrolling are the students who are the highest risk to leave that college before graduation. Right, so that's another reason that colleges look at it. If your application is submitted and it's incomplete, we are going to email you to let you know. So check the email to make sure, because sometimes what will happen is I'll send an email saying, Slade, we need the transcript for this student. And Slade will write back, oh, we sent that to you. I can see the date when you received it. And then I'll go in the system and look and see, oh, that was mislabeled when it came in. It was actually labeled high school profile. It should have been labeled transcript. We've had it. It's now complete, and we'll then communicate to you that we've got it. You have to check your email because that's how colleges are communicating with you. There's a reason why email hasn't gone by the way of the dinosaurs, right? It works. It's an effective way to communicate with a lot of people to get your message across. 
It's not as fun as texting or Snapchat or any of that stuff, but it works. So you have to be on it and check it. If we're offering alumni interviews, which we will, then we're going to send that out through emails as well. So if you're not checking your email, you're going to miss the opportunity to meet that alum who might be really impressed by your story and communicate that back to our office as your application is being reviewed. Some schools like NARIS have specialized programs. So we have a campus in Florence, Italy that students can spend their entire freshman year rather than coming straight to New York. They'd go there first or they'd go to Dublin and then they'd come back to New York and spend the remaining three years. The only way that you can be considered for that program is if you interview. It's a Skype style interview. And how are you going to learn about it? Email. We're going to send you an email inviting you after you've indicated an interest, inviting you to do that. So please, please check your email. Um, I want to briefly discuss social, social media as well. Uh, we recently hosted over 200 school counselors on our campus on election day for their professional development. And one of the topics that came up consistently was the challenges that social media presents within a school and within the college admission process. So you as a student are responsible and you probably have some sort of technology agreement that you sign and your parents sign while you're here at Trinity Quality, but you're responsible for your social media account. So if you are liking things that might be considered inappropriate, if you have pictures on it that you probably wouldn't want grandma to see, um, if you're saying things on there, you should go in and you should try to clean that up. Colleges are not going through, at least our college is not, going through and checking every single account that a student has to see if it's appropriate or not. But what will happen and what has happened is that after decision letters go out, you may be accepted to the college you really want to go to, and then a friend of yours, or not so much of a friend, who didn't get into that same college might get upset, and a parent might email that college a picture, a screenshot of something that you said on social media. And then that college, like Harvard, like Marist has in the past, like Bard has in the past, like many colleges has, have in the past, may then turn around and contact you and let you know that you're no longer an accepted student at that college or university. Right? That's a real thing that happens pretty much every year. Acceptances are rescinded because of things that students do on social media. Now, social media also has a lot of positives. You can reach out and communicate with current students who maybe are just a year older than you. Right? Seniors this year can reach out to freshmen at colleges and universities really quick and find out, hey, I've heard great things about the engineering department. Can you tell me a little bit more about it? What's the food like? How'd your housing selection process go? You know, what do you think after your first semester? You can watch YouTube videos about the campus. You can learn all sorts of things. There's so many positives. But the downside of social media is that you are responsible for what you put out there. Right? If you like something that they think is unseemly, then that could be it. That could be all it takes to rescind your admission to that school. So just be very careful with it and make sure that you have you cleaned it up before your applications are out and decision letters come back. And I know uh, Mr. Mead and Mr. Harp, I'm sure, will we'll talk to you more about that. Um, but I want to end on a positive. This is really an exciting process. Uh, this is something that you're going to meet a lot of really interesting people. You're going to see a lot of really cool campuses. And um, I hope you have fun on this journey. And for some of you, I hope I get to interact with you as you're exploring Maris. Uh, hopefully this has been helpful. And I uh, wish you a happy new year, and I look forward to talking with you again on the panel. Thank you. Um, we're going to take a break in a second. There are two groups that are going to be in the lobby. Uh, there's a, um, at 4.30, we have a breakout session with AXA advisors. and. Um, they're in the lobby now with some materials if you want to take some to learn more about what they do. And then, if you're interested, go to the 4.30 presentation. We also have a sign-up list out there if you'd like to uh, enroll in the uh, high-end testing classes, which will be offered in the spring. We do one for the ACTs and one for the SATs. And the juniors typically uh, take those review classes then. Before we go on break, I want to tell you one quick little story because uh, it, it's worth mentioning. Parents, uh, I'm going to give you a heads up. Uh, this, you're going to have a moment if you go college um, 
driving around. You gonna have a moment where you're going to want to try to kill your child. <laughs> and I just, I, I'm just going to be very polite. Um, go, don't worry. Uh, you're not the first. Um, I, I had a daughter. I still have the daughter. I did not kill her. <laughs> I have a daughter, and uh, we drove all over the great state of New York looking at schools, and um, we pulled into Hamilton College which is just one of the most magnificent places on earth. And um, she turned to me and said, oh, we can keep going there. There are too many trees. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, yeah, there are a lot of trees, yes. There seem to be uh, conifers and hardwoods. And where are we headed with this? She said, I, I, I don't like this place. There's just too many trees. <laughs> You're going to have this moment when you're going to wonder if you should kill said child immediately or just count to ten and keep going. My advice is to keep going, count to ten. There's going to be some irrational conversations. It is part of the process. Please feel free to call me from a payphone somewhere <laughs> and just vent. Uh, I've heard some great stories. But it will happen. It will happen, so don't panic. You're also going to be looking at a school, and as a parent, you're thinking, God, I would not go here in a million years. You get in the car, and your son's going to say, oh, my God, is that place awesome or what? <laughs> and you're like, yeah, it's great. <laughs> go with it, please, because they're the ones going to school. They're the ones going to school, and, and sometimes you just can't have a good answer for too many treats. It is what it is, and you just got to keep going. So let's take a 15-minute break. When we come back, we're going to have a panel discussion. Mr. Hart will, will run it, and uh, we'll get into some uh, finer nuances of the podcast.